Hello, everybody. My name is Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and I have the distinct privilege of introducing two fellow podcasters. One is Ron Rabinowitz, and one is George Case III. This is the first edition of Senators, Twins, Past, Present, and Future. Ron, George, it's your show. What do you hear? What do you say? How are you? Ron, I'll, let, you, I'll let you go first because uh, about the right, are the most right. current. <laughs> yeah, uh, didn't know who was going to go go first. Ron Rabinowitz. Um, yes. How are you, sir? Good. How are you, Ralph? And George, how are you? This doing? isn't your first Thank experience you. in podcasting. You no, are no. a um, a partner of Peter Trunk on this network, the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and you do the Dodgers show. And That's uh, um, you live in Minneapolis. You're a lifelong um, baseball fan, and um, I sure am. Minneapolis fan and employee, part-time employee <laughs> at the present moment. Um, you're a great candidate for being a co-host. And uh, you're a co-host with the son of a former major league star with the Washington Senators. His name was George Case, and he was the fastest runner in baseball at the time he played. And arguably, because we'll never know, could have been the fastest runner in baseball of all time. Um, George Case III, how are you, sir? I'm just fine. Thank you. Appreciate the conversation, and I'm looking forward to it. Oh, good. This is going to be a weekly thing, and um, you guys are going to talk about the illustrious history of the Washington Senators, and I say that with uh, uh, not with tongue-in-cheek. We were kind of talking off the air. George, um, what were they deemed first in your heart? Uh, tell me how that went. Continue what okay. you were talking about. Well, I, we, I, I would be bringing up the fact that there is a sort of a rap on Washington baseball and the fact that they did lose, uh, you know, a franchise two different times. And now, of course, with the Nationals, uh, they're in Washington for the third time. But but there had been, a you know, an old phrase in baseball, you know, first in war, first in peace, last in the American League with regard to the Washington <laughs> Senators. And my point was that that is not 100 percent accurate because – Washington did win the 1924 World Series. Um, They won the American League pennant in 1925. They won the American League pennant in 1933. And in two years that my dad was playing, 1943 and 1945, uh, they finished in second place. So they weren't always the last place ball club over the years. And, and of course, many, many great Washington players over the years, uh, starting with probably the, the greatest of all, pitchers in Major League Baseball history, uh, Walter Johnson. Huh, right. That's right. Uh, he was tremendous. Teams. And you know what I admire most about Washington, Washington centers? They just had the W on their uniforms. There was, right. It was like the Yankees. There was no change. It was continuity. It was what you expected. They might have changed the outline of, of the letterings, uh, the, on the patches of this, that, and the other thing. But it was so classy, and it was opening day. And down the line, you're going to get to share some experiences that you had um, on opening day. You had some interactions with a, with John Kennedy, if I, if I remember from an interview that you did on my, my show. Um, great stories. Ron, what is it that you're doing with the Twins? I know you're a big Jackie Robinson, not only an aficionado, you were a close personal friend of Jackie's throughout yes, his I lifetime. Was. Yes, I was. And I work part-time for the Twins. A lot of tour groups come through the stadium, through Target Field, uh, a lot of kids, a lot of schools. And they have me come in, and I do a, a – uh, presentation about Jackie Robinson, which seems to be very receptive to the students. They really love it. 
So I do that from time to time, uh, part-time for them. I've gotten to know a lot of the officials there. Um, and uh, I know Clark Griffith very well. That's the son of Calvin Griffith. And also um, uh, Clyde Deppner, who is the um, curator and historian for the Minnesota Twins. So hopefully we can maybe get uh, both of them or one of them at one time on our show, which I think would be interesting. And you know, you talk about the Washington Senators. Uh, there was a Broadway musical uh, in 1955 that came out called The Damn Yankees. And it was oh, based on the Washington Burton. Senators. I still see Gwen yep. Burton. Yep. That's right. That's right. You know, if, I, if I can jump in, if I can jump in here one second, Ron and, and Ralph, I just sure, wanted sorry. to mention when you 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 bring up damn Yankees, this is a true story. In uh, in summer theater around the eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey area where I live, there was a, uh, a facility called the Lambertville Music Circus, and one of the shows that they had was damn Yankees in what they call summer stock. And uh-huh. my dad and I were invited to the the opening of Damn Yankees, and Sinjin Terrell, who was the producer and promoter of the Lambertville Music Circus, brought my father up to center stage and said, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to a real-life Washington senator. And my dad had to stand up and say a few words, <laughs> and the photographers took pictures and all. So when you bring up Damn Yankees, that sort of hits home for me because – you know, it was all about, uh, you know, Washington winning the World Series and defeating the Yankees and the devil and right. all that. But but the yeah. great music from it and, and the fact that, that we had a personal connection to damn Yankees. And also, I've seen a photo of, of my dad's best friend, Mickey Vernon, backstage uh-huh. with Charlie Dressen uh, on the opening night of <laughs> damn Yankees with Gwen Verdon. So I just want to like interject that. That's great. <laughs> How exciting. That's so exciting. Well, uh, you very, know, very when we talk, whenever you say Mickey Vernon, I'm reminded of Vic Wirtz. Did they not have parallel-type careers, <laughs> those, those two? Um, they were a lot lot alike. Big slow. Well, I think, you know, personally, I mean, I, I did not know Vic Wirtz, but, uh, but I was very close to Mickey Vernon since the time I was a little boy. Mickey Vernon was sure. a line drive hitter. He played in, in Washington and, and hit a lot of line drives for doubles off the right field wall because he was not a fly ball hitter like a Babe Ruth or, or Lou Gehrig or whatever. But but Mickey certainly had a lot of power, but it was line drive power. And I think uh-huh. Vic Wirtz, he'll best re- be remembered not only for his great skill as a ball player, but the fact that he hit that 430-foot fly out to Willie Mays making the catch in the 54 World Series at the Polar Right. Race. Absolutely. I and remember that. The throw that, that held the runners. That over-the-shoulder, over-the-shoulder catch. Absolutely. <laughs> and the turnaround wheeling throw where, where he kept Al Rosen out of scoring position, yeah. if I remember. It was an incredible that. play. Right. Will, Willie, you know, and, and, and when you say in baseball history and the annals of people talking about baseball history, all you have to do is mention the word the catch, and, and they'll know what, right. what you're talking about. Everybody but, knows. Right. That's right. It's almost a shame that Joe Montana and Dwight Clark use that expression. They use that expression for the catch in football. In football, right. Uh-huh. But it's um, so, such an inconsequential sport compared to baseball. Couldn't oh, right, that. right. <laughs> Just I'm a, the I'm a baseball. I'm a baseball person, so I'm not going to disagree with you, Ralph. Right, I agree well, with I you too, Ralph. <laughs> I Although I have respect, I have great respect not only for football, but for Montana and that catch. Yes. <laughs> but they right. should have called it the nab or the snatch or. <laughs> Just something else. Don't take away from Willie for crying out loud. <laughs> right. Right. Because okay. the real catch was Willie Mays. That was it. Right. Was the real catch. You know, I was ten years old when that movie came out. Nine years old, maybe. Uh-huh. And um, they told me that the song had a, had an uncle, my mother's uncle actually. Uh, my called him Uncle Sam, and he was a heart doctor in New York. And when that song played. My family kidded me. They said, that's Uncle Sam's song. 
That's certainly one of the most the famous song. songs he of that, of that he show. He'd come for Yuntif. He'd come for Yuntif. Yeah. Yeah. Right. you got to have heart. I'm going, okay. <laughs> he's looking at me. Miles like and miles and miles. Miles and heart. miles of heart. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Joe Hardy. Um, uh-huh. Just the character of Joe Hardy. All of us yeah. would like to get young and fulfill yeah. our dream. But he That's was right. faced with the important part. What's the most important part of his life? It's his wife. It's his love. It, going back, he didn't take any of Gwen Verdon's advances um, <laughs> on screen. Um, that was left to the imagination, of course, which made it great when you're nine years old. Like, you're right, of course. <laughs> I, I was told. I was told, and I don't know how true it is, but I was told that that the character of Joe Hardy was was based upon you know the life of Roy Sievers, and uh, of course Roy, yeah. one of the greatest of all Washington home run hitters. So whether or not that was true, but that was the story that was related to me. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, very interesting. I couldn't think that wouldn't exactly be the way it worked out historically with Roy Seavers, but um, Roy Seavers had a lot of power. He was a oh, that's oh. You know, He was a big um, home run hitter. Yeah, he was. Yeah. And uh, he must have lasted 10, 15 years to his career. He lasted a long time. Um, yeah. Well into... Didn't he come back with the second Senators? Did, maybe I'm a Yeah, Roy came back, I think, briefly. Um, it was after my dad had left Washington. He, my dad and Mickey had left, but I think Roy came back briefly. But, but Roy, as, uh, as, as Ron knows, uh, Roy Seavers was one of the four great right-handed power hitters for Washington, you know, beginning with Seavers and then, and then Killebrew and, and Allison Killebrew. and Lemon. And, and, of course, Killebrew and Allison – you know, both played right. for for Washington as well as the Twins. So, uh, the twins, you know, right. it was a there was a tremendous was correlation line. because at one time Griffith Stadium had a huge left field. You know, it was 407 feet down the line, and and they had very little right-handed power. And then once uh, Calvin Griffith moved the fence in to to become more reachable, all of a sudden you had Seavers and Lemon and Killebrew and Allison you know, leading the American League in home runs. So it was a right. terrific thing. And then they, when the when the ball club left Washington and went to Minnesota, Allison and Killebrew were, were two of their, their great stars. And, and my dad happened to be uh, coaching for the Twins in 68, and he thought that they had a real shot at the World Series because of the talent they had uh-huh. on the club. But they were over, you know, they had an injury problem, and, and, uh, and Killebrew only played in 100 games. So... You know, they oh. never made it to the World Series. They had a bad year, but but the fact of the injuries. But they had some great, great players, as Ron knows, uh, during that oh, era yes. with the with the Twins. Tony Oliva was terrific, and Zoila Vasquez, and, and of course later on Rod Carew and Jim Cott, Jim Perry, amazing. They were really Mudcat Grant. <laughs> they were terrific. You guys had you guys had players that had career years in '65 infielders. Ron Allen and um, yep. Versailles. There was a, another kid who was the third baseman that um, had a, a very, very good year. And uh, I can't think of his name right off, off the top of my head. But they really didn't develop. Like, like Allen was out of the game uh, quickly, and the, the third baseman I'm thinking at, of was gone quickly as well. Um, but that was a, a fun team to watch. The, uh, it was. Asik was. was on that team. That was a, a hitting team, uh, deep pinch hitters, uh, Killebrew playing a little third. Rich Rollins was the guy's name, I'm thinking. Rich of. Rollins. Oh, boy. Yeah. Another name I was yeah. um, <laughs> And he, he played a little third. Killebrew played first. Um, yeah. It was a nice little team. You had Allison and um, yeah, yeah. good center fielder, um, uh, whose name escapes me too, and Earl Batty catching. That was 
Rose. Colonel Batty, right. That's right. The first significant a, African-American yeah. player in the franchise, as far as That's correct. I, I can think of. And wasn't, didn't come up with the Twins, came up with the White Sox. Um, do either of you or both of you remember the significance of uh, how he, he became a twin? Um, I know they had Sherm Lawler, um, uh, right. the White Sox did. Um, was he traded? Uh, I don't know that all. I don't time. recall. I don't recall. Okay. I know he was with the White Sox at one time, or how bad he was, and then he came to the Twins, I believe. Uh, but one of the things uh, significant with the Twins was in those days they had a tremendous farm club, tremendous. And they brought every year they were bringing up new stars. It, it, it was tremendous. Uh, they had some great, great uh, ball players that came up through their, their minor league system. Um, and every year you had another star. It was just tremendous, whether it was Rod Carew, whether it was Kirby Puckett, or, or, or on and on and on. I mean, you could name so many of them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Tony yeah. Oliva? Hey, look, Tony Oliva, right. right. Yeah. I was with Tony Oliva one day at, at the Metrodome, and uh, he said to me, he says, Ronnie, he says, if I had played at the Metrodome, I would have hit more home runs in favor of <laughs> <laughs> But, of course, he didn't play there, but he's a great guy. I love Tony. We're good friends. George, do you follow the Twins in today's day and age? Yeah, I, I certainly follow them. You know, being in eastern Pennsylvania, we don't, you know, we don't get all the coverage of the Twins that 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 we would if we lived in the Midwest. But the fact right. that my dad did have a, a a personal connection to the Twins meant that, or means that I certainly follow them. And and a lot of the players that that Ron has mentioned, uh, you know, were there when my dad was coaching and. And he worked with Cesar Tovar, and he worked with Carew and and Oliva and and, and those guys, and, and Jim Perry and Jim Cott. Matter of fact, uh, right before my dad died, about a month before he passed away, my dad had had a phone call from Jim Cott just to see how he was doing. And I remember my really? father saying to me, oh, nice. "Boy, that was so nice of Jim to call me because you know Jim Jim didn't have to do that, but he did it because he's a class person, a very very thoughtful individual, and and uh, my dad really appreciated that call." Yeah, that's, that's nice. great. No, Jim was a great guy. He was uh, a great guy. Terrific. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to mention Jim about Pat the Twins. That was the best fielding uh, you know, pitcher of my childhood. Well, you know, there were some there were some great pitchers that the Twins had, obviously. But the one person I wanted to mention, uh, I, I heard the name, you know, Calvin Griffith. You know, Calvin was the adopted son of Clark Griffith, who owned the Washington Ball Club. And when right. when when Mister the elder Mister Griffith died, you know, Calvin took over the club and then eventually moved the club from Minnesota from Washington to Minnesota. And one of the right. other executives, uh, Ron, you might have met her, was was Thelma Haynes Griffith, who was married to Joe yeah. Haynes, who was a pitcher with the Senators, and Thelma. Uh, was Clark Griffith's adopted daughter as well. Their their name right. had been Robertson when they lived in uh, Canada, and uh, huh? Sherry and Billy Robertson were two executives with the Twins. So there was sure a they were. Billy connection uh, between the Washington Ball Club and my dad and the Twins uh, for many years. So you know, obviously, I, I've always followed the Twins because I I feel a you know a personal connection myself. Of course. Of and Ron, course you live do. in Minneapolis. <clears throat> uh, I do. I to do. the ballpark, and how many games do you see a year? I see probably a dozen games a year. I mean, I go in there sometimes. I'm always there on April 15th, of course, and they bring me out on the field for Jackie Robinson Day. Um, right. I've been out there every, every year, um, and it's been very exciting. Uh, that, that's been really thrilling. Um, and I, I'm involved with the Twins quite a bit. It, it's, they're a good organization. They've had their bumps for the last couple of years, but uh, I think these new guys that are—I can't remember the name right now—but the new general manager and his assistant. Uh, one is from the uh, Texas Rangers, and the other is from the Cleveland Indians. And I think uh, the two of them will uh, definitely uh, start bringing some new blood in there and 
and turning this this team around. And I think Molitor has been a terrific uh, help. He, I think he's a great manager and a, and a wonderful man. So we'll see uh, what happens. Certainly a good, certainly a good, <clears throat> what they call a solid ball player. He, he would be in there day after day. He probably played 155 games a year. You never heard him Assistant. complain. He played never. when and what position and yeah. in what what order the the batting order um, they needed him. And Molitor and Money, those guys were fun to follow yeah. with the Brewers. Sure. Uh, um, That's right. Can't complain about them. And the tw- what I like about the Twins, they have longevity in their managers. Gordon yes, they do. Hunter, oh, ups and downs, in and outs. Gordon, yep. They realized Gordon Hyatt was the same manager when they were winning than when they were losing. That's their, right. The big responsibility yeah. for putting the ball club together was based on the, the general managers, the scouts, player development. Sure. That um, that's what does it, and Gardner um, Kelly before him, uh, maybe ten fifteen years uh, uh-huh. uh, between them of um, right uh, of continuity. Long consistency, right? Continuity, right? Exactly. Um, and there's a lot of that you makes know, for a nice organiz- That makes for a nice organization because it sure does. People want to expect. They don't want changes, radical changes year after year right. in their uniforms, right. in their managers, and for right. the most part in their players. If you can keep uh, – that's what I admire about the, the L.A. Dodgers more right. than anything. Kept that infield together for, forever right. with Russell and uh, Lopes and and the Penguin. And Garvey. And Harvey. Garvey and yeah. Penguin, that's right, yeah. Yeah, you it develop a fan following, and it makes it easy for you, you raise your kid, and he's between five and fifteen. You got the same ball players out there. It makes right. it real easy to be a fan. Yeah, it really so, does. It really does. With free agency good. the way it is today, it isn't as much consistency as it used to be. You know, uh, it used to be if you were with a with a team, you you stayed there the whole your whole career practically. You know. Uh, right, which you is look good at the, news yeah. for the fan, perhaps, but terrible sure. news for the player that's locked in, maybe behind right. a superstar, right. maybe that's in the right. minors, somebody doesn't like him, yeah. has to spend his career back, you know, never, never advancing, and right. now things have changed. And they sure the have. of um, change, the man who made it possible was a fellow who ended his career with the Washington Senators. Also an African-American, Kurt Flood. Kurt Flood, and, that's right. Um, so baseball is a very interesting game. Um, it sure we're talking is. a little off the air that um, probably the not the – I think the Red Sox were literally – the last to integrate, but the Senators, yes. especially um, early on before they moved to Minnesota, very few blacks. Julio right. Pierre, that's right. Ron mentioned yep. was um, he wasn't a technically Latin. right. He was a Latin American, right? Right, exactly. Which yeah, Washington, Washington did integrate. have a lot of the Latin Americans, a lot of Cubans. Uh, the yes. so-called uh, Cuban connection, and and that was because Joe Cambry was their super scout and, and really brought a lot of players in from Cuba, uh, didn't pay them anything, and, and uh, over the years there were so many great players. You know, some were, were light-skinned, some were dark-skinned, but, but they, were, they right. were Cubans or they were Latin American players, and I, I do recall my dad, you know, many times talking about they often needed an interpreter, uh, in the dugout to talk about life, not not to talk about baseball, because they could talk sang, sang, sound lang, sign language and, and know what each one of them was saying. But in talking about sure. life in general, 
a, a translator was necessary because the American players didn't speak Spanish and the Spanish players didn't speak uh, English. So, you know, that right. was a really problem during the uh, early days of Washington baseball in the 40s in particular uh, when there were so many Cuban ball players. Uh -huh. They had Where? pictures like Emilio Pascual was, right. was Emilio Pascual. Cuban and Pedro great, Ramos. Great pitcher, uh, Pedro Ramos, uh, you know, another great pitcher. Yeah. Uh, Connie Marrero, who just passed away not too long ago in Cuba, was 101 years old. Uh, he, when he was right. pitching, you know, nobody really knew how old he was. And uh, yeah. you know, the <laughs> fact is that they, that they were some great, you know, Cuban uh, ball players over the years that that played for Washington. And 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 you're absolutely right. There was, as far as I know, there were very few uh, African American players over the years uh, during those years that right. played for Washington. But certainly. You know, the Cuban influence was very strong. Right. It was very strong. There was a the Oliva was that from Cuba. Castro, was Castro not scouted by Washington? <laughs> Ralph, was that, that was the story. The story was, from <laughs> what was told to me, that Joe Cambra, who also signed my dad, actually uh, did go down and scout, um, you know, Castro but came back and said, you know, he, he's not major league caliber, and, and whether or not, you know, he ever would have played or the world situation would have been different if he'd ever signed a contract, you know, we'll never know. But he certainly, you know, Castro did have an affinity for baseball, but I don't believe that he had major league caliber credentials, yeah, and I yeah. think that's why the right. Senators passed on him. Uh -huh. Okay, now one more thing I want to mention before we get off the air is that on the page for your show, The Senators, Twins, Past, Present, and Future, is on Comfortably Zoned Radio, is a picture with the elder Mr. Griffith and your dad. And the elder Mr. Griffith is awarding your dad with a certificate. It's not just a certificate, it was a war bond. Tell us how he, your dad won that and what the circumstances were. Well, it, so again, Rob, photo. it's interesting you mentioned, and, and the fact, as Ron knows, and you talked about how different baseball is, back then in those years of World War II and, and the great conflict of, uh, you know, our, our country against uh, the Nazi regime and Japan, players who, if they were 4F, and my dad was a 4F because he had a separated shoulder. So they could not uh, enter the service because they were the draft board, you know, had rejected them, but they could still play baseball. But what the players who were playing at the time would try to do whatever they could do. There was a lot of uh, uh, fundraising uh, events that went on, and this happened to be one of them. It was a fundraiser at Griffith Stadium, and they wanted to measure uh, my dad's speed. So... The world record had been, I think it was 13.8, and so my dad circled the bases in 13.5 very, very fast. And at the end of it, it was, it was a AAU timer who verified the time. So my dad had set a world, what they considered a world record, which I don't think means anything today because nobody even does it. But he was yeah. awarded a $100 war bond by Mr. Griffith. And that's what that picture is of Mr. Griffith presenting my dad with a hundred dollar war bond, which was part of the you know the lifestyle back then. There were war bonds and and fundraisers for the army and the navy and the air force. Uh, they were very much a part of uh, American life. And the fact that FDR in 1942 had proclaimed his uh, so-called green light letter to keep uh, Major League Baseball playing during the war. And, uh, so interesting. The expression, Carrie, oh. what'd you get for your bar mitzvah? A bond. <laughs> a bond, that's right. We used to get bonds, exactly. Okay, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure it was the same way you were, the same same where I was. You get a bond for your bar mitzvah. And I think it, was, it looked good, too, because you could buy it for 18 bucks, and it says $25 yeah. bond. So, yeah, exactly. In the envelope, right. I got a 25 that You had to wait seven years, but that's all right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, my, my dad thought he money. was my dad thought he was rich. He had a hundred dollar war bond. <laughs> so. Hey, let me tell you something. He was a hundred dollars in those days was, uh, was a lot of money. Was a lot of money. Even three quarters of a hundred dollars yep. was a lot of money. Right. That's right. 
And, and you uh, know, there, there were 16 uh, senators that are Hall of Fame members. And there are seven Hall of Famers from the Twins. Not all yeah, of them. There's, been a, there's been a very strong correlation between the Hall of Fame and, and Minnesota and Washington over the years. Yeah. And, you know, yes. again, my dad happened to be fortunate because he played with several of the Hall of Famers from Washington. Matter of fact, Al Simmons yes. was a, an outfield teammate of my dad's, and, and Rick Farrell was his, was a catcher with the, with the Senators when my dad was playing. And, yes. and then my father played against, uh, you know, other Hall of Famers from some of the greatest players of all time, and Ted Williams yes. and Gehrig and DiMaggio and Feller. And so, you know, we've had a very strong uh, connection. And matter of fact, the DVD that we have, Ball Field to Battlefield and Back from FDR to JFK, uh, two years ago, was honored at the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown uh, during their movie festival. So we were quite happy about that. Oh, that's great. That's great. Let, let me bring up Al Simmons a little bit. Al Simmons had the most underrated career of all the really great ball play. He was a really great hitter, very underrated. And I know that because I I played board games where simulation simulation before the computer does it automatically for right, you. Right. 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 But and they they were based on cards and and dice and spinners and all that things. And if a card wasn't included in the game, you could go back to statistics. On other cards that and player other players and compile a card for someone. Well, it was either DiMaggio or Al Simmons wasn't included in in this particular game. I tend to think it was DiMaggio not included. And I went through some very painstaking number crunching along with um, a buddy of mine and. We determined that Al Simmons' stats were power aside a little bit, very close to Joe DiMaggio's stats. Mm. Really? That's some that's, high praise. Well, that is. Um, that is. And, and, and my dad, I'll tell you a little, another quick story, but Al Simmons, when he played for the A's, and my dad was a high school student in Trenton, New Jersey, only 30 miles away, Al Simmons was his favorite ball player. And thought he was a really? great hitter and a, and a great player. And all of a sudden, in 1938, they're outfield teammates together with Washington. So, you know, <laughs> Al Simmons oh, and my wow. dad became very friendly. And, and my father always said that Al was one of the best uh, hitters that he ever saw with with the nickname Bucketfoot Al. Uh, a natural <laughs> hitter. A natural hitter. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Um, good memories, gentlemen. And uh, you both sound good on the air at the same time. Um, well, good. I enjoy this. I have. Yeah, a I enjoyed it too, very much. You. I know how good. you love Let's do it. Let's you. keep a little. Uh, your word, Mr. Rabinovitz, continuity, yes. and keep that That's going. Right. Same time next week, same bat station. Let's count okay. on it, and uh, we'll talk during the week. We'll pick a topic that interests all of us. We'll get into what's coming up with the Twins, who their prospects are, and we'll keep looking back at memories because uh, you reach a certain age, that's basically all you got. That's right. That's right. Yep. And, I look uh, forward to it. Hey, thank you very much. <clears throat> Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, gentlemen. George, we'll see you yep. next week. And uh, for those of pleasure. you out there, keep on keeping on. Right. We'll see you now. Thank you. Bye-bye.